All right, I know it's hard to believe, but welcome to the last week of the semester. All right, today is Monday, December 14th, and <clears throat> as always, if you go out to the in-class folder, there is a folder with stuff out there for you. What it is, is it's an online version of Chapter 1 of the book that you're going to be using next semester for the 152-167 class. Here's a book. I'm holding it up right in front of you. That's it. And uh, I found just Chapter 1 online, so I'm going to go over that between today and Wednesday. Remember, if you have any homework that you have to uh, turn in for any class, I'll accept homework through 8 p.m. on December 20th, which is next Sunday or the Sunday coming up. I'm also supposed to remember, remind you that if you have not uh, signed up for classes for spring and you're going to, please do as soon as possible. And finally, over there by the printer again, <clears throat> is the envelope. Yeah, I know you did them already, and it just seems like you just did them. But if you could do end-of-semester course evaluations for any class that you're taking with me, you're, you're welcome to do them for online classes, too. Say what worked, what didn't work. I liked the book. I hated the book. I liked the instructor. I hated the instructor. Whatever it happens to be. All right. So if you come out there to the 1214, what you'll see is a bunch of stuff. And it's a bunch of the material for Chapter 1 of the book. All right. And as I've asked you to do, I just copied it over myself. And I'm going to start, like I said, going over the book. So this is the book. It is in black and white, of course. Now, when you look at this, this is a very encapsulated version of what this book is about. You'll notice there's part one, the first six chapters. Part two, the next five chapters. Part three, the next four chapters. Part four the next four chapters, and then part five, which is the rest of the book. Now, you may be good enough that you can go over a book with 29 chapters in it in a semester. I don't think I am. But I am going to start from the beginning. All right. And, again, I'm going to go over chapter one now and very quickly go over it again um, in the spring semester. But if you look, the first four chapters of the book are kind of a combination of review of this class, 152-119, and the 152-157 class. All right, most of you are either in that class with Jim or you're taking it online with me for the 157 class. All right, then in chapter, chapters 5 and 6, notice chapter 5, jumping into jQuery and JavaScript syntax. All right, so it's kind of a, a primer or an intro to jQuery. Chapter 6 is on how you can use JavaScript in an object-oriented way. We basically didn't talk about that at all this semester. All right. Then we jump into the next section. That's all on jQuery. You can read that yourselves. All right. In fact, this section is basically all on jQuery 7 through 11. And so is this section basically all on jQuery. All right. 12 through 15. We, I hope... Hopefully, we're going to at least get through that material. All right? That's what I'm shooting for. Now, will we get through more than that? We'll see how it goes. Now, the stuff that's in here, again, of course, I'd like to cover that. That's the UI stuff. And we'll see. It may be that some of the chapters that we go through next semester, we don't cover in a lot of depth and breadth of coverage. You can pretty much be guaranteed, though, that we'll go over these first six chapters, then you're going to have an assignment should make sense. You'll get at least a week's worth of class to work on it. That assignment probably will be a uh, perpetual assignment. In other words, you'll do part one of it here. Then we'll add some more stuff, and you'll do part two of it here, etc. All right? That's my hope, at least. All right? We probably won't have time to get into the Angular stuff. But what I'm going to ask is that you save this book because there's a good chance that in fall of 2016, you'll be going into the Angular stuff. You know, when people say, well, are you going to be teaching that? You know what? I have no idea what I'm going to be teaching in fall. Just the way that uh, stuff just keeps changing around here. Okay? 
You know, and, and if you ever wonder, and, and again, I'm not asking for any sympathy or anything else, I'm really not. But if you ever wonder why a lot of times you look at instructors and during the semester, they may look a little peeved at times, okay? It used to be about five years ago, we got a, a certain part of our, our load was faculty advising, okay? We were supposed to do it. And uh, it was fine. You know, you got paid a little bit extra for it. It wasn't even a, a, a class's worth of work. But then it was, well, we're not paying you anymore for faculty advising. And if you don't want to do it, don't do it. Okay? Now we have a, uh, an in-service coming in in January where it's welcome back to faculty advising. You're going to do it. We're just not going to pay you for it. And this keeps happening and happening. We haven't gotten a raise now in three years. So when, you know, when people say, yeah, but you make a lot of money, I'm not saying, you know, we, we make a decent living. I'm not saying that. That isn't even the point. All I'm saying is, is, is they just, management keeps saying, well, do this and do this. And, do, and they keep doing it with smiles on their faces. And in my opinion, they keep doing less and less because they expect us to do more and more. Then they're wondering why in the last two or three years they've had a record number of people either retiring or just quitting. So don't even be surprised if some of the teachers that you see right now are not back in full because they're just getting tired of it. All right, I'm at the, the what do they call it, the precipice of my life. You know that recently I just turned 59. And to be honest with you, one of the jobs, I applied for six jobs last, last summer. I got offered four of them. All right, but with one of them, the guy said, you were offering you the job, but I have an interesting question for you. Why the hell, you're almost 60, what the hell are you doing this for? because it would have involved moving to another state. All right. And I didn't really have a great answer either. But I just said kind of, to me, in many reasons, I, I don't want to be in this state anymore because I've had enough. All right. All right, then they go into each chapter in depth and breadth of coverage. So again, this is the one we're going to cover between today and Wednesday. But you'll notice we go right into debugging. And, and that's, that's a, I think this is a really good thing because we've never spent a lot of time talking about debugging a JavaScript program. All right, and what I'm going to do, just so you know, I, I want to mention a few things because otherwise I'll forget to say them. And I'll, I'll say them again, though, in spring. First of all, um, if you are taking this class and if you're taking the 152, 143 class in spring, which is the Intro to Java programming class, in the Intro to Java programming class, we're using the Eclipse Editor. You already saw it last week if you were in the classes here. This book also uses the Eclipse Editor. I'm not going to. I don't like the way they do it in this book, so I'm not going to. All right, I just want to mention that to you. The other thing that they do a lot of in this book is they use a product that's called Node.js. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that product, except for the fact that when you use it, that's going to be your interface. Virtually everything you do, you do from a command line. I don't like that either. If there's a GUI alternative, <clears throat> we'll use that. So we are going to. Okay? All right. But then, you know, this is basically HTML5 syntax, CSS syntax, JavaScript syntax. So that's the first five chapters. Is like I said, it's a lot of its review. We'll do that, and then we'll quickly go over the object-oriented stuff, and that's the end of part one. So you can plan on there being an assignment after that. All right? Same kind of thing as you go through the different sections in here, so that, that's enough of that. All right. So the first chapter of the book, as you can see, it, it's kind of like a, a primer for everything that follows. In other words, notice, getting ready for creating dynamic web pages. I guarantee you that you will understand what dynamic web pages are if you don't already by the end of next semester because you're going to be creating them. Your assignments are going to be to create a website and the website will get more and more interactive as you learn more and more things. <clears throat> That's the idea behind it. All right. So they talk about creating an Angular, JS, jQuery, and JavaScript friendly development environment. I'll talk about what the author does. And you're welcome to download Node.js. They show you how to do that. You can go to your virtual desktop and do that if you want to, but you don't have to. All right? I'm going to use XAMPP. Yes, which you already have on the system. 
All right. Talk about how to add JavaScript and jQuery to web pages, how to construct web pages to support jQuery and JavaScript, and how to create your first dynamic web page. The example that they actually have in here at the end of the chapter, maybe you've seen this before. Some people think this is kind of a cutesy little thing. There's a web page, and on it, I don't know if it's got a pair of eyes or what, but you're supposed to try to click on it. And every time you get your mouse closed to click on it, it moves someplace on the page. But the idea is it's showing you something dynamic, something interactive. Okay? All right. So as it says, the lesson takes you through the world of jQuery and JavaScript development. All right? It goes through a lot of stuff at a very high level. Now, some of the stuff that's in here you might have heard from Jim, you might have heard from me, but I don't really think that it hurts at all for you to have at least a little bit all right, of review, or if it's not review, going over this stuff. Such as, the next section starts with understanding the web browser slash, or web server slash browser paradigm. All right, and they look at the components that you have when you're working on a website. For a true website, you will need to have a web server. All right, and again, my, my hope is that everybody in this room right now recognizes that if I come in here and I type in this, oops, if I type in blackhawk.edu and I hit enter, all the magical stuff that happens when you do that, you are going in here and you from your browser are typing that in. That literally is being sent over the internet and it's being grabbed, for lack of better words, by a web, one of Blackhawk's web servers, all right, that has to answer your request and give you back that page. Not only does it have to give you back that page, but it has to give you back that page in a format that you and the system understands. So it's returning it in HTML. And it may not sound like a big thing, but to me at least, I think it's pretty cool that you're able to type something like that in, hit enter, and almost immediately get something back. And it may not seem like a, a lot right now because that's just Blackhawk, but you can type in URLs, you know, something ends with UK, and just that fast you can get something back from England. All right, the same kind of thing. All right, it, it, it truly is, and I don't mean to sound a little whatever, but it truly is a worldwide web. All right. So as they mentioned, without a web server, no data would be available at all. Everything you would do would be done on just the client. Now, I do want to mention something. Whether you use Node.js or whether you use XAMPP next semester, it really isn't going to matter. But regardless, what we're doing is we're using this machine right here as both our client and our server. So they will be both our client and our server. And I want you to understand that. What that means is if you create something in it, it's going to be designed just to run on that machine. Now, one of the things that John will be showing us and some, he's, he's talked about it a little bit, but we'll get into more depth and breadth of coverage on this in spring, is how you can take that information and upload it to the Site5 server that's out there that he's got accounts set up for all of you. And then the advantage of doing that is if Roger wants to go home and show his family what he's been doing, he can, he can get to it from the outside. All he needs is an Internet connection to be able to do that. The other advantage of that, too, is what you'll be able to do is if you apply, for example, for, a, for an internship or you apply for a, a regular job and they say, can I, have an ex Damien, can I see an example of your work? You can show them. You can go right out to Site 5 and show them anything that you've saved out there. All right. You may or may not have heard this, but last, I don't know when it was, John, last Wednesday, whatever it was, Tuesday, I had uh, two young ladies come in here all right, one was from Tech Systems, who's an IT staffing place outside of Madison, and the other one was from CUNA, Credit Unions of North America in Madison. The lady from CUNA, probably both of them, but at least the lady from CUNA, she's going to be coming back in fall. And any of you who are interested on that day, and I'll give you notice, all right, um, I would recommend that you dress up a little bit. You don't have to have a suit and tie on or a dress, but you should look presentable. And I'd say have, a, have a, uh, a resume with you because she's going to be taking names. And if you get selected for CUNA, it's a 12-week it's a twelve week internship. Not that long, three months, right? But the idea is if they like you, they offer you a job as soon as you get done with the internship. A full-time paid job with benefits. 
I don't have a clue as to what they pay. None. All right. But I know that they've got a lot of people working there, so I'd imagine that they pay, they're pay. they at least fairly competitive. So what, you, well, I don't want to live in Madison. Okay, then don't worry about it. All right. If your goal is to graduate from here and get a job in Beloit or Janesville, it's going to be a lot harder for you. It's not that there aren't the jobs, but there aren't a lot of entry-level jobs where people with very little to no experience, you know, are going to be, they're going to be looking for. Well, which, that's a good question. They, they set them up at different times. It might actually be that, that they interview in fall and it might not be till next summer. I don't know. All right. All right, so the web server, you need a browser, as it says, and you just saw this. The browser sent the request to the web server and then displayed the result for the user. And as it says, a lot of stuff is happening under the hood. I don't understand a lot of it. I don't really care. You know, I always give, give the analogy that, you know, I, I leave my, drive, or my, my garage in the morning. You know, I put the car in reverse, and I, you know, as long as it goes in, in reverse, if it went in drive, it'd be bad because I'd end up in my kitchen. All right? But as long as I put it in reverse and it goes, I don't care how that happens. All right? All right. As they mentioned here, probably the three most popular browsers still are Chrome, IE, and Firefox. Some people would disagree with that, you know, because Safari is a big up-and-comer, especially people who use the Mac because you get Safari on there for free. All right. As far as I'm concerned next semester, virtually every single thing that I do, I'm going to do in Chrome. Now, if you don't like Chrome, you can still do the stuff in, in uh, Firefox, and, and most of it you'll still be able to do in IE. But I'm just telling you what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over. Because if the goal is to get through at least 15 to 20 chapters of this book, we can't be doing everything and say, now here's how it looks in this browser, and here's how it looks in this browser, and here's how it looks in this browser. There's just not time. All right, so we won't be doing that. All right, you've heard this term before. We've looked at it a little bit. The DOM, the Document Object Model. You're going to have to understand that next semester. We're going to go into it in as much depth and breadth of coverage as the book goes into it. Do you, do you have to understand the DOM to be able to create a really good website? There's a lot of debate over that. Let's just say that if you want to be able to harness the full power of the web, you need to understand, at least have a, 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 an initial or an introductory understanding of what the DOM is. All right. Browser events. You've done some of this stuff already. So, in other words, if, if uh, you, you've got a button that's on a web page and you click it, you want something magical to happen. That's the browser reacting to an event. All right. The browser window, the URL. And I do want to mention, it may not sound like a, a big thing, but I, I do want, want to make sure you at least hear this. So, if I say to you, URL, let me make that a lot bigger. So if I say URL, most of you know that's a uniform resource locator. All right, so it's something that oops, that you start with HTTP or HTTPS or something else. All right, but it's going to basically break down into a web page someplace. You may or may not be familiar with that term, URI, which is a uniform resource indicator. All right. If I drew a big circle on the board, and the board looks really nice, so I don't want to do that. But if I drew a really big circle on the board, and in the middle of that circle, or, or around it, I wrote URI, that would mean that big circle would hold everything that's a URI. If I made another circle inside of it, and inside of that circle I wrote URL, that would show that URLs are part of URIs. All right. So a URI is a much more generic concept. And the weird thing about a URI as opposed to a URL if I type in a URL and it doesn't exist, I get an error message, correct? The way that you use URIs on web pages, they don't have to exist. In fact, quite often they do not exist. All right. We've talked a bit, and you've seen it in here. You've seen it in the 157 class, talking a little bit about HTML and HTML5. The big thing about HTML5, just so you know, they talk about stuff in here with audio and video, and all that's true. It is. But the big difference between HTML and HTML5 is HTML5 is designed to be semantic. So the idea is, if you put stuff inside of a tag that says header,
that stuff that belongs in a header tag. If you put stuff in, a, in, in something that, that says nav, that would be in some kind of a navigation. All right, so that's the way you're supposed to do things. All right, people break these rules all the time, but it's the way that you are supposed to do things. Now, one thing that, that um, I don't remember if it's this book or one of the other ones that I'm, that I'm using next semester, but you go in there and the author talks about footers, and they say, well, footers are things that always appear on the bottom of the page. All right, and that's probably what you've learned too. But in HTML5, you can have a footer any place. You can literally put a footer in your header if it makes sense to do that. So it's on the bottom typically of something, but not always just on the bottom of a page. All right. This should mean, you know, everybody should get that by now. All right. And those of you who are still struggling with this stuff, again, there is a way this must be set up. The only thing I disagree with what the author has put right here is I always write doc type in lowercase. All right, you don't have to do that. It'll take it either way. And, of course, you wouldn't put these line numbers in there. The author put them in there for readability for you. But you should be able to look at that and really understand every single thing that's on that page by now. All right? doesn't give you much, and it, there's really no CSS on it at all, so it doesn't look very nice. But you should be able to, to look at that and see and figure out exactly how it would render. All right. In order to make it look nice, okay, that's when you use CSS and CSS3. Okay. And one thing I want people to understand, and you probably have heard me or Jim or someone else say it already, when, 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 um, when the World Wide Web Consortium, the W3C, when it comes out and says, we now have HTML5, we now have CSS3. People think, yeah, well, those are standards. No, they're not. The W3C does not make standards. They make what are called recommendations. And it's up to browsers and browser manufacturers as far as which of these recommendations they want to implement and which they don't want to implement and the time frame in which they want to do the implementation. All right. So the newest is CSS3. It's got a lot of neat stuff for it. You know, the, the buttons now can have rounded borders on them, etc. And we've looked at some of that stuff. All right. So the idea is, what, what have they done here? Well, remember, there's three ways that you can put in CSS. The best way, which is to put it into an external file. All right. And the way they've shown here, which where you put it inline up in your head tag. Okay. So that's all in here. And then probably the worst way where you stick it in line on different elements. So they've gone through and they've changed this that you see right here in figure 11.1. And they've changed it to this. Now, you, you might have your own idea as far as whether or not it looks better or it looks worse. And that doesn't really matter. All right. But the idea is you see that the font size has been increased. We've added, um, we've added simple images with those check marks, etc. All right. So you should be able to look at everything that's in that style element from here and from here. All right. And that should make sense to you. You should also, everybody in this room should be comfortable with going out to the CSS validator. All right. And however you typically do it, I just typically choose the bidirect input and, and copy my stuff in here. All right. You should also be familiar with and comfortable with going out to the W3C validator, which looks very similar. But if you've ever tried to put, a, put um, CSS in here, or if you've ever tried to put HTML into the CSS validator, you know the problems that you have. It gives you a lot of errors. But you should all be comfortable doing that. And the reason I'm mentioning that to you is next semester, if I say, okay, for the first part of this assignment, you are to create this website. It'll have three pages on it, you know, maybe an about page, an, an intro page, and a contact page, as an example. All right? And if I say to you, all, you know, that, and it should have CSS and everything should validate, that should make sense to everybody. You should all know how to do that. All right? All right. Then they kind of break away from this and they start talking about protocols etc and exactly what's happening in here and you may have seen this already but I, I think it bears showing again anyway I 
I never really like most of the pictures that they show in here. We'll just use that one. It's pretty simple, but you can see it right there. All right. So the whole thing they're talking about in here is this is a request response architecture. So this is you at your browser. You key something in, you hit enter. That sends a hypertext transfer protocol request that gets grabbed by some server someplace. That server may act on it directly, or that server may pass it off to yet another server to have it act on it. But eventually, that server will send back an HTTP response. All right, and it'll have to be formatted in such a way that it can be pre presented on the client browser, and it makes sense to the person looking at it. And that's really what they're starting to talk about in here. All right, they do get into talking about HTTPS. You probably have noticed that already. For instance, if I come in, and again, I, this, this should be all stuff that should be kind of second hat to you, but if I go into Amazon.com, all right, so if I go in there, and you'll notice it's Amazon.com, not a problem. Okay, so if I go in and I say, oh, I want to go in, and uh, I was looking at, a, at some Packer books for my father for Christmas. So if I decided that I wanted to, for example, look at this book, Okay, and notice it's still Amazon, etc. But if I say add it to my cart, everything still looks cool. But if I go out to my cart now, all right, and I say proceed to checkout, well, that changed. And why did that change? Because for security reasons. Because now what you're going to be able to do in there is give credit card information, you know, depending on whether or not you got it through PayPal or you've got it through your credit card of choice, or whatever. All right. And the reason I'm bringing that up is they talk about HTTPS in here. One thing to realize and one thing for you to understand, what they say here is, is, a, is a perfect paragraph almost, the one that starts here on page 18 or 14, and it goes on to the next page. It says it adds an additional security level to ensure secure connections. That's a misnomer. There is no such thing as a totally secure connection. All right. What HTTPS does is it makes it even harder for a potential attacker to get in and grab that information. That's what it does. All right. All right. They talk about HTTP headers. You probably have worked with these a little bit. You'll work with them more starting a little bit next semester. But you'll work with a lot of the stuff that you see in here, you'll work with it a lot next fall, especially in the PHP class. See, the transition is made, and I think I've mentioned this to you before, but I want to say it again. The majority of stuff you do during the first year of the program here is introductory stuff. You're getting an introduction to .NET. You're getting an introduction to Java. You're getting an introduction to HTML5, an introduction to CSS3, an introduction to JavaScript, an introduction to jQuery. All right, but especially forgetting for a second about the um, C sharp and forgetting about the Java, the stuff that we're doing is all on the client side. Basically, everything that we're doing this semester, semester and most of next semester, is on the client side. Then most of the stuff you do in the second year is on the server side. That's when you learn server side languages like PHP, ASP.NET. All right, and it's funny because every semester, just about, I'll have somebody who says, "Well, you know, we learned PHP and we learned ASP.NET, but um, what about the one for Java, which is JSP, Java Server Page? Why don't we go over that one?" And I used to have all three of them that people took in the same semester, and they was driving people nuts because they had three different server-side languages they were using in the same semester, and it just got to be too much for people, so we took one of them out of the program. All right. The other thing that you have to understand is the difference between this, a GET request, and a POST request. Okay? And you probably, again, have seen stuff like this before. But if I come out here, if you look, what did I do here? Well, I went into Google Images, right? And from Google Images, I typed in HTTP request and response. Hit Enter. All right? And now look, it's got Google Search. And then everything that you see after that question mark, all that stuff, that's all what's called a query string. 
And what that means is what it's doing right here is a get operation. All right? And the reason I'm telling you that, the reason that it's important that it's a get operation, it shows all the information up in that query string. And I'm not going to go back to it, but if I went back to Amazon, and once I get in, it's not going to show right there what my credit card number is and what my login is and all that. It's not going to show it up there. All right? Why? Because that stuff literally gets sent over the Internet. If somebody else could look at that, they could find my credit card number and other information about me and then start using my, my credit information to buy their own stuff. All right? So the reason I'm telling you that is what you just saw was a get request. And here's, you know, when you have get requests, again, there's, there's a better example. It's all done with what are called key value pairs. So if you look right there, you're going out to dailycreations.com. You're going to the gallery.h, you know, or to the gallery.html page. All right. So what your, what your key is, is gallery. And what its value is, is zero one. one. So when you start working with this stuff, it's all these key value pairs. When you have a get request, what you're going to learn next semester, and I have no idea how much you've looked at it this semester, but ideally, at least a little bit in the, um, in the access class, you've looked at least a little bit at looking at a query and looking at it in SQL mode. Well, if I do this in SQL mode, That says, give me everything that's in the employees table. But when you do a select like that, you can't change it. You can't change information. Select just displays information to you. All right. On the other hand, if I say insert into, or if I say update, or if I say delete from, those are going to allow me to change things. All right. So this is very much equivalent to using a get. This stuff is equivalent to, to, to Get's brother, sister, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's equivalent to using a post because that gives you the opportunity, if you want to do so, to actually change the data. So they talk a lot more about the Get right here, but then they mention the post inside of here as well. All right? All right. Back in the olden days, when people were first starting to create websites, maybe you've seen this, maybe you've had one of these mailed to you, but what companies would do is, I'm not going to create one, but they'd have something like this that was a trifold. Remember those? Everybody used to, we still have, there's one up here. In fact, that's how Blackhawk still has it. Well, I had students come in a couple weeks ago and they got this. With some of the first websites that were put there out there on the system, all people did was they took this and basically surrounded it with HTML so it was out on the website. Okay, but it was static. It didn't change. It wasn't dynamic at all. That's not cutting it today. If you've got a website and somebody comes out to it, no matter what the product is you're selling, and they come out to it, let's say, again, the next week or in the next week and the next week, and it never changes, it looks exactly the same, all right. There's a good chance. I'm not saying that the company won't survive. It depends on what it is you sell. But you need to have some better marketing. All right. All right. So client-side scripting, again, you've been doing some of that. One of the reasons this whole last semester that I asked people to have different files for your JavaScript and your HTML and your CSS is that's the way it's done in the real world, all right? That's how client-side scripting is actually done, okay? So they talk about why you should use client-side scripting. It says there's a couple of advantages. And I'll tell you what the biggest advantage of, of, of it is. And this is what they talk about in here and then down here on the next page. And that is, and you've heard me say this before, that if I'm going to go out to a website and I'm going to fill out a form. Let's say they ask me to register before they give me material. So they ask for my first name, last name, maybe an email address. Maybe let's just keep it that simple. First name, last name, and an email address. All right? Well, if I leave one of those blank, the system may consider that, well, then now that's invalid. I can't accept it anymore. When you are filling all that stuff in on a form, you're still at the client. All right? You're at your browser. 
And what happens is there's JavaScript that checks in there to make sure that you've got something in each one of those fields, and then it looks at your email address to make sure that it's a valid email address. When I say that it's a valid email address, again, all I mean is that what you put in there is put in there correct, it's formatted correctly. You know, I can put in there, this is stupid at this is stupid.com, and there probably really isn't an email address that's like that, but it would pass because there's an at sign in it and there's a dot in it. That kind of an idea. All right? All right. They start to show you then in the book here what's happening when you do this. You may or may not understand it. You may or may not want to read it. You may or may not care. But one thing I liked about this book, and this picture's on page 17, is just the fact they're trying to show you, as it says, there's no processing on the server. The browser gets the HTML file with a JavaScript code. It goes through it, and based on that code, it renders this. And that's the case whether you have the JavaScript actually in that file itself or if you have it in a separate file. That doesn't matter. And again, hopefully you all understand, when I say I want the stuff in separate files, all right, it's not because I'm anal about it or anything like that. It's just that it makes it so much easier for you to go in and, and actually edit and maintain a site when you've got each HTML file that all it has in it is HTML. And then maybe a link to one or more CSS files and a script tag for one or more CSS or for one or more JavaScript files. All right. All right. Then they talk about server side scripting. And again, there are several flavors of this. It says there's two major types of server side scripting. There are server side templates and there's Ajax request handlers. All right. So what's the difference between the two? You learn both. Okay, and we're actually, next semester, we'll start talking about Ajax. I think I've talked with you about Ajax before. I believe I went out to, like, the family video site, and I showed you under the new releases, if you highlight one of the movies and you put your mouse over it, it's going to give a little synopsis of what the movie's about. You move off of it, it goes away. So what is it doing? It's partially refreshing your page. All right, and that is exactly what Ajax does. But we will be using, you will learn a lot of this stuff. It says the first type is to use a PHP, .NET, Java, or other type of app that runs on the server. You will learn PHP. You will learn ASP.NET, which is Microsoft's server-side scripting language. <clears throat> As it says, the main advantage of doing this is that the data processing is completely done on the server. And the raw data is never transferred across the Internet which means it's going to naturally be more secure. All right. The disadvantage is, well, you're working with a server. And, you know, again, I don't know, was one of you in here was telling me, but somebody was saying that, what was it? Um, there, were, there were, on average, on Cyber Monday, there were like six requests being made to Amazon, people buying stuff every second for that entire day. So think about it. They could never handle all that stuff in one server, with one server. So they've got a bunch of servers they put together, might be in the same location, might be in other locations, and typically what's referred to as a server farm to handle all that traffic. Blackhawk has more than one server. All right. I don't know how many regular servers they have to handle all their stuff. It's not nearly, of course, what you'd see with some place like Amazon. So then they're showing in here. They're kind of giving you a little bit of a uh, comparison and contrast between what's happening in here, but the big thing is, there's another component. There's a server-side component in here. So again, the, the second type, as mentioned here, is AJAX. All right? And the idea with AJAX, asynchronous JavaScript and XML, is it allows for a partial page refresh. Okay? And it may, it'll make some sense next semester, Ideally, at least, it'll make even more sense the following semester, okay? And there is an example in here also, and I've got all these examples. You know, I copied them. I copied them over. All right, so I believe they're all in here. But what's interesting about this example 
is if you run it, the output doesn't look very much different from the original one. It's got, I think it, I don't remember if it has the, uh, uh, the, the dots in front of it, you know, the, the markers, but it just shows this. But the, the difference between this is it's using Ajax. It's grabbing this from an external file, and it's changing stuff based off of an external file. I don't want to go into this code right now. Why? Because it's the last week of class, and the last thing I want to do is to confuse you with that stuff. I would say if you want to get a really good start on what we're doing, so when you walk in here on day one in spring, you have a good, you know, an idea of what's going on. If possible, try to read the first five chapters. All right, especially those of you who have fallen behind in classes this semester, I would strongly suggest that you try to get ahead next semester. You know, and I try to do the same thing. All right, never seems to work real well, but at least I try to do the same thing. I'm, I'm ahead for a while. All right, so this next section, this is where they come in and they talk to you about setting up Node.js. And they mentioned that, well, when we're doing this stuff, we should have some kind of an IDE, an integrated development environment. Well, good, bad, or indifferent, probably next semester, when you see me writing code in here, I'm still going to be using Notepad++ for this class. All right? And Notepad++ is not an IDE. It is not an integrated development environment. It is an editor. It's got a little bit more power to it than a lot of other editors do. It's color-coded. You've noticed that as soon as you save a file as a .html or a .css, the colors and stuff in there change. All right, but it's not really very powerful. I want to concentrate on the code, not on the IDE. Okay? For the development web server, as it says, when you're creating stuff, you should never put it on a live server where other people can see it because it could have problems with it. So again, our development web server is going to be XAMP. And you may or may not have looked at this. I have no idea if I've ever shown it to you or not. But what we're going to do next semester is you'll come in here and you all should have that VMware Horizon client. And when you double click on it to bring it up and double click on your desktops and you log in, I think you know how to do this. I think I made a mistake typing, but we'll see. No, I didn't. All right. And you bring that up. Okay. And it comes up. Then what you'll see underneath here is if you go down to your all programs and you go down to the very bottom, you'll see XAMP. And under XAMP, you'll see a thing that says XAMP control panel. And if you do that, it comes up and it looks like this. That's what the control panel looks like. Okay. And so you're going to start this up. If you, want to, if you want to be able to use your machine here as a server, you have to, it's real hard. Now, that's it. That's all you got to do. Now, I don't know how Denny's got his room set up, not to be funny or mean, but I don't care. But for the 147 class, you know, if you click here, now you've got MySQL capabilities. And that's what that class, the 147 class, is about. So you can come in there and... You can start running things. If I want to run MySQL from the command line, I just click Shell, and I type in MySQL minus U root. Now I'm in MySQL. You say, well, that's too hard. I don't like a command line interface. All right? You don't have to use a command line interface. He may show you my uh, MSQL workbench, which is what they use with a book. The other thing that you can do is under MySQL here is you can click where it says Admin, and it brings up... PHP my admin. You can use this in here to create databases, to create tables, to change data, to run queries, to do virtually anything you want to do. All right. But the point is, hopefully you notice that there wasn't really a whole heck of a lot of work. And if Roger says, well, you know what, I'd really like to go and download this on my own machine. I got problems using at home going out and using the uh, virtual desktop. Well, in order to do that, all you have to do is to go out to Apache Friends org, and that's the XAMP page, and you search under there at XAMP for Windows. You click there, you go down someplace in here, I don't know where, but someplace in here there is a download for it. All right, and you just download it. You accept all of the default options. All right. I would recommend it if at all possible you try to use the one that is hooked up to the virtual desktop. You can uh, 
occasionally have problems copying stuff back and forth between different XM environments. Do you want to jump in here and say anything? Feel free to, John. All right. But they have you set up Node.js. So I went through this. I went out to here. I went out to the virtual desktop, typed that into, um, typed that, that into the address bar, and basically chose to install the package. I didn't use this one. I just went right here, HTTP colon slash slash nojs.org. Nojs.org. So I went there, went down to the download, just grabbed you know the stable one, all right, right there, and downloaded it. I followed all the steps. I'm not going to show it to you because I've already got it on the system. All right, so I followed all the steps that they showed in there, and then they say if you want. Go ahead and, you know, you can basically get into it. So it says type node to launch. That was nice. It says type node to launch the um, node.js in a JavaScript shell. So I came in here, went into a command prompt, typed in node. All right, I think I have to change to where it is. So uh, I don't know if it's on C colon or D colon, but yeah. I, I followed their steps. Again, I do have it in here. See if they show it here. All right. Maybe you think I'm lying, but I'm not. It's in here someplace. What happens, though, when you run it is this. You're at a command line interface. I don't like that. What I just showed you in XAMPP is not a command line interface. All right. That's why we're going to use that. But if you want to come in here and do that, you'll be able to do so. Then they tell you how to configure Eclipse as a web development IDE. All right? And I'm not going to run through that. The, 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 the key thing is, John, between John and Adrian and Terry, they've got Eclipse on these machines in your virtual desktop. What you have to do is you have to add in an Eclipse add-in if you want to be able to, to work and use Eclipse for the stuff that's in this book. I don't think it would hurt anything if they did that, all right? But you'd have to follow their instructions and follow them completely and do everything they tell you to do. I'm not going to do that. And the main reason I'm not going to is, by and large, when we have the Java class in here, Eclipse is stable. And I don't want to do anything that's going to possibly harm that. So I'm just going to leave it the way that it is. But they go through all the steps if you do want to do that. Then they talk about how you can create your own express web server using Node.js. If you follow that, essentially what you're doing then is you're creating something that would be complementary to XAMPP. But again, it would run, and it would run using a uh, command line interface. All right, the last thing that's in the chapter is on creating a dynamic web page with jQuery and JavaScript. So we'll do that after the break. According to my the clock here, it's 849, so let's come back at 905, please. <laughs>